Welcome to this UNIBAP talk about autonomous mission using onboard intelligence. So with me, we have our guests, uh, Dr. Tom George, CEO and co-founder of Saraniasat, and Nick Kramer, uh, research engineer at NASA Ames Research Center. And with me on my side, I have Dr. Frederick Brun, uh, who is the chief evangelist of UNIBAP. My name is Matthias Persson. I'm the VP of space here at UNIBAP. So welcome all of you, and we have an interesting discussion about autonomous missions using onboard intelligence. So gentlemen, um, Tom, you've been around for a while, uh, seen most of things in, related to space, and now we are at the, at the cusp of a new paradigm of using autonomous or intelligence for autonomous missions. Could you put your view on that, uh, in, in that field. Um. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to uh, express my views. Um, uh, as you know, my background is from uh, NASA and space as well, um, having been at JPL for the bulk of my career. But what is really exciting for me in space is uh, the advent of constellations uh, at different orbits and the, the possibility of autonomy uh, within these constellations, uh, not for multiple applications, uh, uh, you know, to coordinate uh, acquisition and processing of data, as well as for anomaly checks, uh, reconfiguration of orbits and so on. And uh, I am very, very uh, glad to be participating with partners. I, I uh, uh, appreciate a lot of the work that Nick uh, has done and. Uh, I'm sure he will expound on this quite uh, eloquently. Um, and my other, my primary interest from a commercial standpoint is to do acquire Earth observation data, big data, that is uh, uh, hyperspectral, hyperspatial, and hypertemporal, and be able to process it on board to get actionable information down to the ground in uh, um, within 24 hours of acquisition. Um, that is the holy grail in order to make uh, uh, space-based data platforms have an impact on daily lives uh, on Earth in multiple business verticals. And Nick, why is um, autonomous systems important? Well, I, I think uh, I think Tom really hit on it when he said uh, actionable information, and and that's that's really the key here. Is you want to make sure that you're getting um, uh, the information that you want to act on as opposed to just data um, down in a timely fashion so that you can act on it and, and operate on it. And most of these cases, you're really thinking about a scenario where um, if you are if you are sort of um, preempting that data collection and that that information, right, um, to distinguish it from information from data um, by having that be um, a ground based action beforehand, then you're really lengthening the time that 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 your loop exists, right? And so you're delaying any capability you have to act on the results that you that you're requiring to collect. Um, so that's really where if you push that on board, um, you can sort of eliminate an extra loop back into the ground and really make sure that you're only getting what you need um, to make your your sort of uh, effective decisions, and that you can sort of maximize the information that you're collecting at any given point in time. So from the science perspective, um, you know, you might have a short-term transient effect that that um, if you were to uh, wait for the ground to respond back to you to say, oh yeah, we really want to sort of um, slew and follow that that object, that that you know, weather phenomenon or, or whatever it may be, um, you may have missed it, right? You, you may have to wait for the next time. And, and so all of a sudden your revisit time becomes a much more critical aspect as opposed to um, lengthening the durational window for your data collection. And NASA have been pursuing this for quite a while. Why do we see this happening now? I, I, well, you know, there's a lot of reasons that, that go into that. But, but if you sort of like, uh, I think one of the big pieces is uh, sort of the change in, in hardware that you have, right? So the, the rad tolerance that, that sort of went there, we had this very traditional concept that you're that the nodes that we're putting into space were always um, 
um, essentially just data collection points, right? And that was because we had some constrained processing capabilities, maybe storage capabilities, and and those sort of gave your uh, had limitations that you had associated with with your ability to do that. Um, so it naturally made made sense that you're going to continue to operate, you know, from a a ground standpoint. But as we sort of expand those capabilities, we can sort of move this into um, you know uh, software on board and pushed onto that edge. Uh, that's really what opened up this possibility. Tom, you have a background from JPL, building sensors for deployment on Mars. How do you see the transition from individual sensors to large constellations of sensors, both in low Earth orbit, but also in deep space? How will that be changed uh, with these kind of new cloud computing capabilities being introduced into space? Yeah, I think I think the primary shift would be from... Uh, putting emphasis on individual sensor measurements as opposed to a system level approach where you take a, a complementary sensor suite and perhaps even multiple platforms in order to characterize the phenomenon uh, more um, extensively and in depth. So for uh, I, I typically use the blind men and the elephant analogy when I try to describe this uh, approach by saying, that you know, when the blind men were asked to describe the elephant, depending on the body part that each uh, held, they variously described it as a big trunk, uh, ear, and so on and so forth. And and only when you fused all this information from these orthogonal sensors, uh, you, the true picture of the elephant started to emerge. Right. And so, so I think we are now in that paradigm in space where we have, for in instance. Uh, synthetic aperture radar, um, EOIR, um, multiple different modalities for sensing your environment, which can now all be brought to play to create a much richer information set, if you will, for not only for autonomous operations, but also for uh, ground personnel to fully understand the situation that is going on. So that 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 part is very interesting. I mean, uh, what you're describing with with um, uh, having the capacity of of uh, edge computing and, and and distributed computing, but also sensor fusion, uh, compiling the data together and, and sort of get the picture from that, and 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 that gives you the ability to also adapt your mission to either search for more information around that uh, object you are looking at, or and or move on to the next one, right? But I think I think um, just sensors alone are just part of the solution. What you need are uh, really high performance algorithms as well in order to be able to handle this uh, uh, high level of big data that we are going uh, to uh, be acquiring in, in space and processing on board. Because the governing paradigm, as Nick, Nick had mentioned, was that we downlink all the data to terrestrial computers and have the processing done on the ground. Um, and it's also been driven primarily by science considerations also. Scientists do not want any kind of, you know, dirty fingers touching the data before it reaches the ground where they can observe it in the pristine form and, and so on, right? And so they have very little faith in, in uh, process data. Uh, uh, especially ones that have been processed using AI and machine learning algorithms. So, so there is a sea change that needs to happen, or a mindset change that needs to happen, in order to say that there will come a time at which we will exceed the downlink capacity of uh, satellites to send down every bit of raw data that is collected in these multiple sensing modalities. And it is far more important to send information down than the raw data, uh, especially when you consider latency issues, as Nick had mentioned, where you need to have actionable information rapidly in order to be able to uh, address a uh, an, an anomaly or an event that is uh, you know time constrained. And so, um, uh, for that reason, I I I am very bullish on the fact that we will have uh, higher and a higher performance on board uh, uh, with advanced AI and machine learning algorithms to process the data. 
So it's kind of a, an event-driven science we're looking into here. And um, by that, you also have to have some autonomy associated with that. And I would say, how do you explore, how do you explore that part uh, of, of the autonomy of, of a mission, uh, Nick? Yeah, so the, the, that really comes from like a more systems engineering standpoint of, of your assessment, right? So it's like, in, in some cases, um, uh, you need the autonomy because you, you have um, um, some absolute motivation, right? Like, which is to say, uh, if you're thinking about a deep space mission, the, the closed loop transit time of, of what you're doing is, is really uh, not allowing you to sort of have a, a continuous interaction, right? So you need some autonomy there. You, you can't do what you're setting out to do. Um, in a lot of the, the sort of uh, orbital, you know, LEO sort of uh, conditions, uh, you might not have that. It's more of a cost uh, scenario, right? Um, because, you know, you can always pay more and get more downlink time, um, but there's sort of this functional cap that you're, you're existing in there. And so, so when, you, when you go from that perspective from, from your mission, you're saying, well, how am I going to enable um, a larger swath of missions that are cost effective? Right, and that that really changes your paradigm of what sort of science you're 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 looking into, or applications that you sort of have on board, and that's where sort of the small sat combination with um, with uh, processing power and decision making on board um, allows you to creep into. Um, and I also just wanted to piggyback on something that Tom said there, which is you know um, uh, uh, suggesting that that at some point we will uh, exceed our our. Our, our bandwidth and and you know in some missions we've actually already exceeded that you know like a um as i was mentioning before with the the onboard uh data storage capabilities that expanded uh that allowed us to have a new sort of mission paradigm where you might uh, downlink only sub samples of the data and then you command that oh the scientists has looked at this and most of this is not very meaningful but these sections of of the data i want all of it right and then you can get rid of it and you can do that because you have extra storage on board and, you know, that can sort of downlink that paradigm. Um, so, so, you know, these are the trade-offs that you got to consider when you're looking at sort of pushing more autonomy on board is, you know, could you, could you do that? And these also come into like these huge effects of how long you need to have your mission, right? Um, if you're going to get higher gains, the longer your mission exists, right? The more, the more you need to collect things, the more that 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 autonomous operation um, is providing excess value to what you would have if you're going to, to have the ground in the loop. Um, and so so those are really like a, a key key components to, to what you want to look at as you go forward. That's very interesting. And how do you guys uh, see inter-satellite communication bringing value to the table here so if you have two nasa satellites that are compatible with a for our sake a space cloud architecture but it could be any architecture and tom if you're launching five or six commercial satellites do you see a pathway where you can collaborate and share data between different assets in space or are there hard regulatory reasons that it can't happen no, I, th I think uh, yes, uh, yes and no. Um, uh, and I was going to touch upon some of the military aspects of space that uh, we'll, we'll address in a bit. But uh, putting in a plug for Space Cloud, uh, I think I think what you guys are doing is amazing in Space Cloud because for once it uh, allows a cloud computing uh, architecture to exist in space. That is really very exciting. Um, and now to have enabled seamless uh, communications between and computations, coordinated computation, I would say, between uh, satellites in, within a constellation as well as satellite ground, if if the latency permits that. Um, so, so I think uh, definitely, um, especially when it comes to small satellite paradigms, uh, it is impossible to carry an entire a comprehensive sensor suite, right? You, you're pretty much dedicated to a single sensor, right? Uh, you cannot have a multi-sensor suite. So by necessity, uh, if you are into some kind of a tipping and queuing operation, as Nick was pointing out, uh, then you definitely do need the coordination and the 
the intercommunication of the data as well as computation to figure out you know what the elephant looks like so so um, so in order to make that happen uh, i see uh, a- autonomy being key and also uh, inter-satellite communication and computation. Yeah, and, and I want to like hop on there because th- that's a really great point about about sort of the ability to do that 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 tip and queuing, right? Um, and and you know even even an example sort of those heterogeneous sensor suites that you might have, um, you know that that's really the future, or, you know, a future aspect of sort of lowering that cost and enabling uh, sort of a larger you know expansion of the science. Um, but, but, you know, you can imagine, let's say, a very simple case um, and is, you know, you have something that has a very large field of view, uh, right, that is going to be the first in, in, in your um, uh, constellation or, or your distributed space system that's going to pass, right? And that allows you to then uh, give, if you have the communication capability, you can allow sort of the, um, uh, let's say, maybe a lower, uh, smaller field of view, but higher resolution variation. Um, or a, um, a smaller field of view, but maybe a, a active sensor, right? That is trailing to then have the capability of investigating um, a particular area of interest, right? And this gives you an opportunity to maximize the amount of time. Whereas, you know, in a more traditional sense, if you were going to do that, you might have um, uh, the first the first wide field of view downlink that. Uh, then have the ground say, oh, well, there is where the interesting thing is. And now you're waiting for your revisit time, right? Or, it, and you're hoping that you haven't, you know, uh, uh, moved beyond your capability to do that, right? And then, so the number of satellites you need to sort of do that in a smaller revisit time is is increasing. Um, so now, again, that's sort of another spot where your your overall cost for your performance has edged up. Um, where you, if you have sort of that cross links, that communication between the satellites, you can push that down and functionally address um, sort of the the cases you really need. And that's sort of really the, the maximization of, of what you're extracting from there. And that, that's sort of like the notional example of what communication between your, your assets is doing for you. And, and, and that's super easy. And with my background, I do know that there are Space Act agreements and CRADAs and many different vehicles of cooperation, but those have so far typically be, been for for hosted payloads or for data sharing on ground, etc. We It sounds to me that we are going to need some form of legal framework to have data sharing in space and the accessibility of one spacecraft talking to another one, allowing someone to connect to you and get your data and send data to you as well. So are we in any shape or form set up today to have that kind of conversation? Now when the data traffic is moving from ground sharing into space sharing. I I think while Nick thinks about it, I'll uh, jump in and say that some early steps are being made for instance, between NASA and ESA for harmonization of the data and so on. But there is also a cybersecurity concern that comes in when you start uh, promoting inter-satellite communication where you can potentially compromise data if a, uh, uh, you know, um, a, a malicious uh, a, uh, uh, you know, agent jumps in and uh, tries to either sabotage or um uh f- siphon off the data so so there are new i mean while cooperation is desirable uh, there are an, uh, there are a bunch of uh, overhangs that have to be addressed uh in order to make it happen um not that these are insurmountable i think they are i mean we have terrestrial cooperation between multiple countries seamlessly and so so I'm pretty sure that the same can be achieved in space, but um, one has to consider all the potential possibilities of uh, uh, failures and uh, uh, you know loss of data as well as uh, intentional disruption uh, or either of the data or uh, uh, you know destruction of the data. So so these these kinds of impacts have to be addressed while opening up uh, inter-satellite communication. So I hope that was 
sufficient uh, filler for you, Nick, to come up with uh, the actual answer? <laughs> uh, I, I, I I don't know that I would actually have an actual answer. I I, I, I mean, I, I think the actual answer is, is you know, it's, it's rather complicated, right? And then there's a lot of sort of uh, um, domains and ways you can you can address, you know, these various issues. Um, you know, my, my area is very technical. So I think of the technical approaches, um, but they're, you know, you hit on that, that there is sort of some regulatory, some agreement, some framework that is um, desired and, and necessary um, uh, to do that. Uh, I, I actually don't have a good, good gauge of what that looks like. Um, um, but what, you know, what I focus on generally is making sure that, that uh, um, you know, the technology that we enable, you know, is, is something that, that could fit into, um, you know, flexibly into future paradigms that, that, that uh, um, in regulatory means that might come up. That's, that's interesting because I was thinking about the uh, autonomy in mission if you use uh, onboard intelligence for, for um, uh, reasoning systems to, to, to fly or, or to, to uh, orchestrate or, or, or change or, or whatever you would like to do. How do you verify the behavior of such a system in advance? I mean, in a way, you, you, you may launch a constellation Let's say you go to Mars and, and, and look at specific phenomena there, and given the 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 um, event, uh, the mission will behave in in one way or the other. And uh, for having a good understanding of how that behavior would be, or if you make an update to your autonomy, how do you verify that, and how do you sort of make sure that you don't lose your assets or lose your or at least you get the most out of it, <laughs> in a way. Again, I'm venturing into areas that I have no expertise in, and so take what I have to say with a pinch of salt. But uh, but uh, there is a, a movement to uh, to work on digital twins, and digital twins are becoming popular not just for maintenance types of uh, 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 applications, in complex machinery like jet engines and so on, but also to simulate a mission scenario and to make it as realistic as possible uh, by providing real data to populate that uh, that simulation, right? And so for the, c the scenario that you were talking about, Matthias, one could have some kind of a validation uh, uh, brought up by through simulation and you collect you know, you correlate that to the actual measurements being made, but it is matching what your simulation tells you, or I mean, right. uh, the the other the other possibility is your simulation is wrong. So, so you know, this has to be as as uh, Nick said. These are complex questions that need to be worked out on a case by case basis before we can standardize it across the board. And I think Tom really like like that that point there of of the modeling and simulation approaches to generate what you're doing. Um, um, I would term that like as a, as a critical importance, which is the synthetic synthetic data generation that you're going to have from the environment, right? And so so there there's various sort of proposals out there, and 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 uh, there's no silver bullet, right? And so a lot of this really depends on what your your particular domain you're operating in is, right? And your risk factors in association with this. Um, so you've seen you've seen um, sort of uh, continuous research in this area um, for I don't know twenty plus years now in relationship to to how would you want to do this? Are you going to have a parallel watchdog that is a uh, uh, checking your constraints that's going to then just shut off? Uh, right? Let's say this is your classic uh, put the satellite in safe mode, right? And and these are things those are scenarios that work really well. Um, when you're the only one there or you're moving relatively slow, there's not a lot of um, inherent risk or, or, or what you're observing isn't as dynamic. So the, the risk of you missing something is low, right, in those scenarios. Um, so those are really great approaches to do that. And that's a way that you sort of uh, ensure that. You know, alternatively, um, you can sort of apply the, the concepts of, of putting in your sort of um, no-go areas as constraints for rules, um, right? These are very good ways to say that that you want to maintain your safety, and essentially you can never violate those constraints. And that's the that's the scenario where if you're looking at sort of what what Tom was referring to of of that synthetic data generation to test those, you really want to articulate and and uh, hit it with 
with sort of any any possible scenario that you can you know conceivably um, create, right? Then you got to go beyond that. Is is where the key is, um, and that's where that that sort of automatic synthetic data generation instead of just the curated test cases is really critical in my mind because um, you need to you you create this data. You say okay. Um, I know these are my requirements that I have, these are the constraints that I'm extracting from my requirements, and I made these test cases for those. And then there's all the conditions that you don't know, that you don't have a good reference for, and that you won't have, the unknown unknowns, if you will. Um, and from there, um, that's where sort of the imagination of your simulation environment is really what's going to be costly to you. And so um, having some initial starting point to say, I'm going to start feeding the, this information in and this data in, and I'm going to start um, corrupting it um, in, in various ways. I'm going to do this automatically, and I'm going to vary it in each in a, in a um, stochastic or unpredictable pattern. Um, that sort of allows you to start building up your confidence in the capabilities you have there. And, and you have to recognize that, that really what this is, is this is a trade off of your risk profile. Um, that is building up your sort of risk of the rewards your autonomy is bringing you to the risk that 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 it, it holds with you, right? If you're going to sit, you have the risk of you're not going to collect the data you need. Um, whereas if you're going to go collect the data, you necessarily have a risk of of whatever action you're taking uh, having you know the future mission um, be there. And so so it's really this domain specific point. But I, I can't reiterate enough that 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 ability to generate that data. And I think really keyly put it in a a, a automated um, and continuous um, uh, integration and testing environment um, for these is is one of those ways that you can build up your confidence um, that it's going to. Work. So do you think it, it it could also be that uh, in the future one would work with dynamic uh, uh, kind of models for for risks? Uh, so meaning that. For a specific part of the mission, you're actually willing to take more risks because the reward is so high. But in other parts of the mission, you, you actually want to want to fly safe, so to say. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's, I think that that's actually like a, a really uh, important part. And actually, a lot of the research that um, that I do and I'm involved in is sort of this trade-off between those two, right? Because um, you're going to have some primary motivation for 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 what you're doing, right? Um, uh, there is going to be something that is 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 um, the take home, right? You don't you don't put hardware into space without a good reason. <laughs> um, it's it's not it's not uh, we'll build it and they will come. It's you have an idea, you've got a plan, and and those are the critical things that you have to have, right? And that's the part that that you're sort of alluding to, which is is the those are the pieces that you you have maybe very little risk tolerance for. Um, but those sort of secondary, um, you know, adjacent objectives might be the cases where where you have this very high upside, right? And and you want you want to enable it, but the risk of of missing it is is inconsequential to your overall operation. Um, and and it's really um, it's really sort of an asymmetric reward scenario that you want to put yourself in, where where you're not putting your primary mission at risk, um, but you're opening your your the opportunities of the autonomy to um, really address those high um, high gain high value situations um, but also but um, you know keeping the floor constant we've talked about autonomy we talked about uh, science applications uh, Tom if you would uh, dwell a little bit into the military the defense aspects of this as well because obviously this is a technology revolution that applies to all different fields and space, and defense is typically very related. Right. Uh, and, um, you know, historically, if you look at it, um, uh, defense has always driven, I mean, driven technology innovation uh, quite a bit from, from ancient times. And uh, this is going to be no different in the sense that space is becoming more and more a contested uh, scenario with multiple countries and nations. Uh, planning to uh, take, I mean, uh, ad, ad advantage, I mean, to utilize space for their purposes and sometimes for adversarial types of uh, applications. So um, I know for sure that the U.S. has taken a proactive step in creating the Space Force as an entity for protecting commerce and to ensure uh, 
you know, safety for our satellites in, in safe operations for our satellites in space and such. Uh, and, and they are also very actively looking at uh, autonomy, at constellations, and so on. So a lot of innovation is going to be driven into uh, situational awareness. Uh, how then do you dynamically react to changing scenarios, uh, et cetera, et cetera, including into satellite communication. So all of the aspects that we addressed in the discussion thus far uh, are key to a military implementation in space. Uh, I, I see these uh, the efforts just growing in the future uh, with both uh, with the Space Force primarily spearheading it in the U.S. And Did Nick, would question? you have uh, something to to add to that? Because uh, you're representing a civilian agency. Um, no, I don't have a lot of insight, unfortunately, <laughs> into that area. Uh, but I think I think Tom Tom did a great job addressing it. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Um, the clock is ticking, and we probably should begin to wrap up. And um, do we have any final famous words uh, to conclude? And maybe you, Nick, would like to go first. Uh, sure. I, I I just think it's a really um, um, fascinating area as we sort of advance through through this development cycle and um, and the enabling technologies you know are, are really coming online right now and from there it's really finding the the applications that are going to take the maximum advantage of them and how we want to do that and integrate it into our traditional workflows so that's I just find it exciting and I'm, I'm glad to you know get to talk about it and share about yeah you know, what we do thank you yeah, and, and Tom. I, 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 so. Sorry, I, I do share Nick's uh, enthusiasm and, of course, uh, you guys' enthusiasm because you wouldn't be in this business if you weren't deeply connected to space. Um, so I think we are on the brink of some exciting discoveries. This will probably this will be the uh, tech, technological frontier of our time um, to explore because the possibilities are absolutely numerous. Um, and so my favorite quotation is from an American Revolutionary War admiral who said, uh, I have just begun to fight, you know. So so uh, I think we are just beginning our efforts and there's a lot more exciting uh, developments to come. And to, to build on that for my ending, I would quote another famous American saying that we all have a digital dream. <laughs> and we are seeing now the... Uh, the digital transformation happening also in space. And that's space. really what encouraging me to pursue this as well. Why should space be different than cloud computing on Earth, really, apart from the space environment, of course? So thank you, I, I all of you, for your <laughs> wisdom and contribution, <laughs> I would say, for this uh, Unibab talk. <laughs> and, uh, it's been a pleasure having you here. And uh, to the listeners into this Unibab talk, I would just say, Thank you very much for listening in and uh, stay tuned and uh, see you next time.